Thanks for staying up later. Dr. Timothy Leary is with us tonight, the one-time Harvard professor who became, I guess it's fair to say, something of a guru of the drug culture during the 1960s and 70s and who popularized the phrase with regard to LSD, tune in, turn on, drop out. And I know you've heard that very same introduction or some version of it a thousand times. Uh, and no matter what 3, you do, 3,049. If, if you go to Mars on a rocket ship tomorrow, still turn on, tune in, drop out. It's going to be somewhere in the first paragraph of any story <laughs> about you. Oh, you're putting the Martians down, huh? <laughs> do you still use LSD? I uh, use any neurotransmitter that my brain tells me she needs to uh, improve my life. Yes, I do. What's the legality of that at present? Is there some way to circumvent it? Can you use it legally? Uh, LSD is now legal in uh, Switzerland and in Amsterdam, Holland, and uh, it is legal in the United States for certain government-supervised, certified uh, psychiatrists to use. It is true, and this isn't an endorsement, it's just a statement of fact, that many biological psychiatrists reputable at UCLA, University of South Carolina, State University of New York, many of them are very, very interested in uh, the use of LSD uh, as possible therapy with schizophrenia, as a source of uh, research with regard to brain function. Uh, so in that sense, LSD is openly talked about in the, uh, in the educational and medical communities, right? Sure is. What about, however, as a recreational drug? Is, is it still used with anything like uh, the frequency that it appeared to have been used in the 60s and 70s? Well, Bob, you probably know I not, have not been involved publicly or scientifically with LSD for maybe 15 years, so I don't know. I would be uh, bluffing if I tried to uh, come on here and talk about what's happening. There was a big article in the LA Times, which obviously you've read, in which uh, demographers and uh, sociologists and doctors say that it is probably being used as much now as it was during the 60s, but it's being used by people who know what they're doing and we're using the correct kind of doses so that uh, you, you never hear about it. Yeah, their, uh, their assessment was that the usual dose today is about a quarter as much as what mm -hmm. people were using in the 60s and therefore the incidences of bad trips mm -hmm. uh, are much fewer, but that they guessed that maybe nearly as many people That's what they were say. users of LSD now as, as had been in the 60s and 70s. Is it important uh, from your standpoint to separate LSD from other drugs that were, uh, that were used at that time and are still used today? Is it in its separate category? Well, it's not important to me. It's important to any kind of a common sense dialogue about uh, neurotransmitters that affect the brain that we separate. There are, as you know, uh, there are 70 receptor sites in the brain that have evolved over the millions of years. Receptor sites are a little lock that is opened by a certain neurotransmitter. And any drug that works, changes your uh, mood or your consciousness, uh, can do that because of its uh, opening up a receptor site. So you're, you're hitting buttons in your brain computer that, that opens up new directories. So that you have uh, uh, cocaine, nicotine, uh, caffeine, uh, sugar. Uh, there are just a wide variety of uh, plant products that affect the brain. And I've always been interested in and done a lot of research on and a lot of writing about so-called psychedelic drugs, psychedelic plants, which have been used for thousands of years by Shaman and uh, like mescaline, peyote, mescaline, peyote, acid. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, LSD itself comes from an ergot of rye. And uh, what we're told is that the uh, human being evolved, in which our brains have a symbiotic relationship with certain of these botanicals or plants, just like your body needs certain carbohydrates and chemicals to uh, keep going. Your brain has to have these, and. Uh, these uh, psychedelic plants, I'm not talking about booze or, uh, or uh, cocaine. Psychedelic plants were used during the period of human evolution, which was pre-Christian, pre-Muslim, pre-monotheistic. Now, the monotheistic religions are male oriented and they're militaristic, and they're authoritarian. Before uh, the monotheist, monotheistic religions, uh, pagan religions worshipped life. They worshipped uh, nature. They were very close. Uh, in a tribal situation, and uh, that, uh, in that context, uh, psychedelic plants were used. Well, as they may have used peyote, but just to, as a distinction, LSD wasn't synthesized till the late 30s or early 40s, something like that. LSD right? has always existed in the form of of, uh, of uh, rust on an ergot of rye. Didn't you know that? No, that's always been around. Could it be used effectively? 
prior to uh, prior to the late 30s, early 40s? Were, were, did, could people access it and use it? Uh, LSD was not as uh, as uh, powerful because they didn't have the ways of taking the ergot and uh, and converting it. But uh, mescaline and peyote and uh, particularly the mushrooms have been used. Right now they're used in, in tribal countries uh, and. Uh, if you notice during, by the way, I, I'm, I'm not interested in drugs anymore, but out of courtesy and because I have to do it, I'm going to talk about drugs, but believe me, i got more dangerous things to talk about when we get to it. But um, um, you can't run a factory civilization in which people are uh, expanding their consciousness. They've got to be uh, doing their job because in an industrial mechanical society, if you're on assembly line, a good person is dependable, prompt, reliable, productive, and uh, of course re replaceable. Have you noticed in the 60s there was a big movement against this? The, the basic issues of the 60s to me were individualism, look within, uh, rediscover uh, the old religions. Uh, and this brings us, of course, to other aspects of the 60s culture, the counterculture, the concern with ecology, because that's a pagan thing, that's a pre-industrial thing, where you're very aware of, uh, of uh, the relationship between uh, the human being and the land and nature. These are almost corny uh, platitudes, but they happen to be true. To go to a kind of shorthand here, it was always your feeling, I'm just paraphrasing your contentions, that the use of LSD was not purely for ecstasy, it was for revelation, because it opened you up uh, to uh, sensory experiences that otherwise you wouldn't uh, possibly be in line for. It expands for, consciousness, yeah. expands consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, it, therefore you'd benefit from it uh, in a sober state as well, as you reflected on on what had occurred while you were tripping. Absolutely. Um, and you always said that, uh, that it should be done under the supervision of people who were experienced with psycho uh, psychedelic drugs, who guided you through the first 10 or 15 trips that you took until you understood how to, how to monitor the experience for yourself. And it should be used with great awe and, uh, and prudence and should be used uh, for noble goals, to discover yourself, to get in better communion with other people, to, uh, yeah, to improve your life. That was, the, uh, that was the goal. But now that having been said, and even if we assume for the sake of argument that ideally that would be attainable in some very controlled circumstances with educated people whose motives you could trust of like sensibilities, even if that could be attained by that tiny slice of society, wasn't there always a great danger that by being an evangelist for this drug that you were going to influence people who were in no position to use it prudently to do so. Well, you're using the word evangelist, which is kind of a loaded word. I'm a scientist, and it's the duty of a scientist to uh, make uh, public his or her uh, discoveries. And uh, I was one of uh, literally scores or even hundreds of uh, reputable, reputable and, uh, and I would even say in some cases distinguished uh, people who were pointing this out. What none of us understood in the, uh, the uh, mid-60s, Bob, was the baby boom phenomena. We were so naive at Harvard back in the 60s that we assumed that psychedelic plants would be used at places like Harvard, uh, ministers, doctors, uh, psychiatrists, artists. Uh, and we were doing it in that context, and it was extremely successful. It never occurred to us that uh, out in San Francisco, Ken Kesey and the Hells Angels and the Grateful Dead, and suddenly you had this mass, mass pagan movement of young people. And unfortunately, many of the young people in the 60s uh, were doing it out of peer pressure. Hey, you didn't want to be the only kid in the block mm -hmm. that was not having this wonderful experience. And uh, uh, we were emphasizing preparation and, uh, and knowing what you're doing, but uh, it was simply a wave that uh, took us all by surprise. Even if we grant you the purest and most idealistic of motives in your own use of LSD and in supervising or, or aiding the use of LSD by people who you came into direct contact with. To what extent do you feel responsible for helping to popularize the notion of the use of this drug and then it got out there and was used for, for foolish purposes, was used recklessly, harmed people's mm -hmm. lives? Yep. Uh, number one, as this article in the LA Times pointed out over and over and over again, the dangers and the abuses of LSD have been tremendously inflated. Uh, marijuana, LSD, and the psychedelic plants, you, everybody knows. They're the most benign, they're the least dangerous. So you tally up the scoreboard and you find out that uh, LSD never produced, the thing about LSD was so powerful 
that someone would come home and they had a glow in their eye. They've seen God or they've danced with angels. And of course, that, that kind of shakes people up. But actually, the, uh, the dangers of LSD are tremendously, uh, uh, they've been demonized. Uh, I guess what the criticism now, if criticism is the right word, comes down to is this. In the 60s and 70s, the drug culture was glamorized. And it was difficult to make distinctions, one drug to another, mm -hmm. one person to another. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you became a tremendous media figure. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as if, maybe not intentionally, but only through miscalculation, you misused the power you had at that time and contributed to getting a notion about drug use out there that you now regret? Well, the notions that I put out there of, uh, of uh, care, caution, guides, uh, noble motives, no, I stand by these totally. The fact that the, what authoritarian people do, particularly moralists do, they, they ignore something like LSD. Then when it comes along, you can't ignore it, then you trivialize it. Oh, it's nothing, it's just like that. Uh, and then they can't do that, they demonize it. So uh, I, uh, see, I, I don't accept the uh, concept that the government can tell any, any adult what to do with their uh, nervous system or their body or their uh, sensory apparatus. The same because censorship of, uh, of movies, a censorship of books. I'm just totally against uh, any government uh, or religious minding my business. Mind your own business. Stay out of my business. What, what was your answer through the years when someone who wasn't necessarily some sort of right-wing reactionary, not necessarily an authoritarian, not necessarily antagonistic to uh, libertarian ideas simply said this the benefits of acid are at best obscure the risks how do you know that well, where's I, the ballpark yeah. I, I, yeah. some people yeah. within the medical community said that that the benefits are at best obscure and the risks even if they've been greatly exaggerated by the media mm -hmm. by the police whomever the risks are not worth it therefore <laughs> so why even if one person in 10,000 would have a bad experience, why introduce the possibility? But 900 people out of 1,000 are having wonderful experiences. They're changing their lives. They're discovering the divinity within. 10% of any group are going to mess it up, no matter what it is. Television, love making, you name it. Guns. Uh, uh, you can't run a society that, what is this, some sort of a mental hospital state where the government, because of one out of 1,000 people can misuse something, the rest of us can't use it? This is a... This is not very logical. And by the way, I'm an Einsteinian. And I always believe in relativity. If you say something about this, you have to compare it with something else. It's not a valid defense of LSD or any other drug to simply say that there are drugs yeah, that we wink at yeah. that are worse. Well, by the way, I'm not defending anything here. I have nothing to defend here. Uh, basically, you know, if, if people watching this program never use psychedelic uh, plants again, I'll be happy because then there won't be any problem and those of us that don't want, uh, understand how to use them, uh, we can go about our business. An incident on the old Stanley Siegel show, a New York talk show. Uh, you were a guest. Art Linkletter calls in during the show. And as many people know, Art Linkletter had a daughter who was involved with drugs. Among the drugs she was involved with, I guess, was acid. Mm -hmm. She had wound up killing herself. Mm -hmm. And his claim was that he held you and, and others who, in his view, had glorified the use of drugs, at least partly responsible for mm -hmm. his daughter's death. Is that a fair synopsis of what happened? Yeah, perhaps though that's ancient history, but perhaps we should tell the audience that uh, this guy Siegel was the Mort Downey of his times. He was an in-your-face, uh, vulgar, tough, kind of mean, harassing interviewer. Not like you, who's sophisticated and uh, very courteous. And Art Linkletter had a show called The Crazy Things That Kids Do. He'd made a living out of making fun of children, and he had a lot of trouble with his daughter. As a matter of fact, uh, I uh, didn't know his daughter, but uh, she was a very nice person. And uh, so in, in fairness to him, he seemed to get laughs with children in a loving way. I don't think he was mocking them. I think he appreciated them, and they reacted well to him because there must have been something yeah. within him that made yeah. them feel at ease. Uh, that's uh, I, I, f I have tremendous sympathy for uh, Art Linkletter to be in that position, and I know he was expressing his grief and his, uh, his sorrow and his despair over the worst thing that can happen to you is to have a, a daughter kill herself, believe me. You've had the same experience. I've had the same experience, so I have nothing but compassion in my heart. Uh, the, uh, I should also say, and maybe your viewers don't know, that art became a very, very 
outspoken right-wing person and ended up in the Nixon White House as an authority on drugs on the basis of this tragic experience. So that, uh, yes, on the one hand, I had to sympathize with him uh, deeply. On the other hand, I had to, uh, you know, kind of counter to bring some logic and common sense into the situation. Dr. Timothy Leary is here. Let me ask you this question. I know that Diane died in 1970. What part did LSD play in this in your judgment? It played a very vital part and it caused her to become bewildered and agonized about life and take her own life. And in All right, I think it was you second. that wait caused a minute. No, wait a minute. Dr. Leary. Your hypocrisy. All right, no, wait a minute. And you are riding it. Did you, right. get, you got to the Nixon White House, didn't you? Because you became, on the basis of his daughter's death. No, wait a minute. He rides That's an into outrage, the Tim. That's ghoulish. Oh, stop. I'm, I will That's throw ghoulish. you off the show if you don't listen to these <laughs> questions. Well, from it. in your view, is there any validity at all to Art Linkletter's claim or the claim of any other parent like him where he might have said, look, I, I can recognize the distinctions that... Uh, LSD may me, have directly me, cause the same, the same mm -hmm. terrible reactions mm -hmm. as, as cocaine or heroin or even alcohol if misused, mm -hmm. but yeah. in, the, in the atmosphere yeah. that existed, somebody takes LSD, they experience mm -hmm. delusions, they yeah. think they can fly, and out the window they go. That did not happen with her now. See, that's again rumor. She was not, hadn't taken LSD for months before that. And I agree that anyone in public uh, uh, position who stands for a uh, controversial point of view which involves loss of life on the part of people who listen has to face that look in the mirror and say yeah now i want to say that my basic uh, rival during those days was a man who i think was responsible for fifty thousand deaths that's lyndon b johnson who sent young americans over there drafted them and sent them over there the ball you know, park scoreboard statistics the averages of damage done during the 60s, uh, whew, uh, LSD was way, way down the list of, uh, of uh, almost negligible casualty rate. How much personal antagonism do you face in 1991, given the, uh, the overwhelming consensus now uh, in the American mainstream that drugs are something that, uh, that we just don't approve of? Uh, people don't want to make any distinctions or say, in this case or in that case, they just don't approve of them. How much personal antagonism do you face? Well, first let me say, as I th said before in this program, I don't talk about drugs. I give 40 college lectures a year and I do about 20 workshops and it's all computers and, uh, and uh, I, I, so it's only on talk shows. And the subject doesn't come uh, up the from only, the audience or anything? Uh, yeah, during the question and answers there'll be questions. But I want to tell you, the college students today are so bored and they're so apathetic and they're so, they feel cheated that I've never been more popular on college campuses. I mean, I mean it's sold out uh, time after time because they're hungry for someone to stand up and be irreverent and make them laugh at the establishment. So, uh, and I've never faced any personal, uh, in, the, in the 30 years that I've been out there as a, a dissident uh, philosopher making fun of religion and politics, uh, there's only one occasion where anyone's ever uh, personally kind of uh, put me down in public. Uh, and when was that? That was in a, uh, a uh, Folsom Prison, when I complained to a guard about something he was doing. It's the only time I complained, and, uh, but uh, I'm basically, uh, you know, I don't come to have fights with people, and I try to keep a tolerant point of view, and people don't uh, get in my face very much, yet. <laughs> What's the positive residue of, uh, of the culture of the 60s? What has permeated the mainstream society and stuck in some way? I'm not talking about individuals who may have benefited, but for the mass culture, what's stuck? Well, I think there are basic uh, notions here of irreverence, and the young people didn't stop a war. But listen, Bob, the 60s movement with its symbols and its uh, purposes and its techniques is still going on. Just last week in Yugoslavia, the, it was in Belgrade. Thousands of students and young people uh, were, were, were protesting the communist government and they were using quote unquote 60s uh, slogans and 60s signs of, uh, that happened in Tiananmen Square, that sense of young people getting together. Do you know that uh, Havel, the president of Czechoslovakia, was quoting Bob Dylan uh, and John Lennon, not Vladimir Lennon, uh, so that the, 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 the movement of the 60s, which is a classic Renaissance movement, left America, clamped down here, Nancy Reagan came in, but uh, it's still out there. Right now in Tokyo, uh, you know, there's a whole 60s type movement uh, going. 
The young Japanese are called Shinjin Rui. I've been to Japan three times in the last year, and I'm going back again in August. My books are being published there. The young Japanese, called Shinjin Rui, that means new breed. You know what they, they want? Uh, they are consumer driven. They want to have, a, mm -hmm. of course, a, they want to dress up well. Uh, they're very much uh, dis disrespect for authority. Japanese kids disrespecting authority. They ain't going to work on Mitsubishi's farm no more. Uh, tremendous openness to Western culture. They know more about. I in Tokyo, I, there's a sign say hip hop rock, punk rock, rap. I mean, they have more varieties of Western culture. The uh, point I'm making here is that these waves of awakening and freedom, which we in this country experienced in the 60s, it's happening all the time. It moves around and. Uh, the, uh, they're always followed by restrictions, but uh, and it's necessary. Uh, you have to uh, kick out and then draw back. Accommodations furnished by the Universal City Hilton and Towers. Make your next stay in Los Angeles a memorable one with our spacious rooms, international cuisine, and the attention of a friendly, experienced staff. That concludes this session with Timothy Leary. He is back next time with some specific anecdotes from some of the strange days of the 60s and 70s, and what he's up to at present. We'll get to that next time. Until then, see you later.